Before saying what computational thinking is, let's first be clear about what it isn't. It's not thinking like a computer. After all, computers can't really think. And it's not artificial intelligence. Computational thinking is a systematic way of approaching and solving a complex problem. Computational thinking is a way of creating and expressing a solution to a problem. Computational thinking techniques are very useful for computer scientists, but they can also be applied to just about any other subject you care to name. In fact, you probably use some of the techniques you're going to hear about in your everyday life. So, computational thinking lets you work out exactly how a computer or a person can go about solving a problem. This is Boris. He's been stranded all alone on an island. His chances of survival are not great, but let's see how computational thinking might help him to survive long enough to be rescued. Let's put him on a slightly bigger island to give him a fighting chance. These are the main techniques of computational thinking. You could solve a problem using some or all of these techniques in any order. One of the techniques of computational thinking that Boris has decided to try first is decomposition. This means taking a large complex problem and breaking it down into smaller, more manageable problems. The complex problem that Boris is up against is survival. And the way he sees it, these are the sub-problems that he needs to solve. His immediate needs are food, water and shelter, but he should also make preparations for rescue, in case he needs to attract the attention of a passing ship or aeroplane. Boris can now take these sub-problems and break them down even further. To feed himself, Boris has decided to take advantage of the excellent fishing waters that surround his island. But he's not a big fan of sushi, so he also needs to figure out how to cook his catch. As far as the water problem goes, Boris has realised that he needs to locate a good source of fresh water, and perhaps come up with a way to purify it. Finding shelter means finding a good location. He will need something warm and dry, and something he can defend from wild animals. To get off the island, Boris might need a boat, or perhaps a signal fire, ready to be lit. Boris doesn't stop there. He will catch his fish with some kind of trap or spear. Cooking the food will require a fire. To get water, he could collect rain and find a stream. He reckons he could purify the water by boiling it. He'll need a fire for that. To find the best location for his shelter, Boris has decided it would be a good idea to make a map of the island. To keep warm and dry, he'll need a fire, and for defence, a spear. What you can see here is called a structure diagram. It was produced using a process called stepwise refinement, and it has a number of benefits. Boris can begin to see where his priorities really lie. Fire, for example, looks like something he will need for a lot of different reasons. And a good spear, for example, will come in handy more than once. Structure diagrams are often used by software developers when designing new applications. They refer to this as functional decomposition. Here you can see a structure diagram for the software that might run on a mobile phone. It's by no means complete, but when it is, a programmer will be able to see where the same program code can be reused for different parts of the same application. Also, if there's a team of programmers working on the application, a structure diagram will help them to decide who should do what. Another computational thinking technique is pattern recognition. This means recognising that a problem you need to solve is similar to a problem that has been solved before, then applying the same or a similar solution. Coming back to Boris, he needs a fire for all kinds of reasons. He needs a good location where he can keep it going easily. He needs fuel, well Boris shouldn't have any trouble finding dead wood. And he'll need a way to start the fire. But starting a fire 
is easier said than done. Fortunately for Boris, starting a fire is not a new problem. His father, who happens to be an expert in jungle survival, once told him he could get a fire going by rubbing sticks together. It's a tried and tested solution. This is an example of pattern recognition. Pattern recognition is common in computer science too. For example, a programmer might be developing a new game which keeps track of high scores and displays who the best players are at the end of each game. Each time you play, your score is compared with those of previous players to see if it's good enough to get you onto the leaderboard, and if it is, the scores are sorted into a new order. Sorting numbers is a common problem in computer science, and there are several well-known ways of doing it. Something called an insertion sort would work well for a leaderboard. Generalization is related to pattern recognition. Generalization means devising a new solution to a problem, then realizing that it can be applied to other problems. As you can see, Boris has come up with a clever way of weaving leaves together, and he's built himself a lovely shelter. But Boris realized that he can use the same techniques to make a basket for his fish, a parasol to keep off the blazing hot sun, and a fine set of clothes to wear. Now there's progress for you. Abstraction is a powerful computational thinking technique that means simplifying a problem by only focusing on the details that matter. Boris decided it would be a good idea to make a map of the island. Lucky for him, a box of coloured pencils and some paper was washed ashore. A map is an excellent example of abstraction. It doesn't have to include every single detail about the island, just what Boris needs to know. And it doesn't have to be a great work of art, as long as he can see where all of the important landmarks are, and it helps him to find his way around the island. Abstraction is very common in computer science. Computers in a network are often connected together as stars, rings or meshes. In reality, these shapes only tell us which devices are connected to which. The actual physical layout of a star network, for example, probably doesn't look anything like a star. Electronic circuits, which might contain millions of individual components, are drawn with simple shapes called logic gates. This hides a lot of detail, but greatly simplifies circuit diagrams allowing hardware designers to focus on what circuits do, rather than how they do it. When a programmer writes code, they're using abstraction. This simple program has been written in a programming language called Python. It adds 10 and 20 together, then displays the result, 30. It looks like simple algebra, but what's going on behind the scenes is much more complicated. The first line of the program instructs the computer to set aside a fixed amount of its main memory, then put the value 10 into it. The second line tells the computer to reserve even more memory at a different location and put the value 20 into it. In the third line, the two values are then copied from memory to the central processing unit, where they are added together. The result is copied back into another location in the memory before being displayed on the screen. In fact, before the computer can even begin to execute these instructions, they have to be converted into sequences of electrical pulses representing binary ones and zeros. Running the program involves the manipulation of these electrical pulses by logic gates inside the CPU. High-level programming languages, like Python, allow programmers to focus on what the code will do rather than worry about what's really happening behind the scenes in the hardware. Programming is an excellent example of abstraction. Another computational thinking technique is designing algorithms. An algorithm is a set of steps to follow to solve a problem. Coming up with new algorithms is one of the most important techniques of computational thinking. Boris is having coconut stew for dinner, and he's made a set of steps to follow. 
An algorithm is another name for a set of steps, or a set of rules, or both. Computer scientists often use flowcharts to describe algorithms, making it clear how one step comes after another. Algorithms often include logical reasoning, another important technique in computational thinking. Logical reasoning means making decisions and doing one thing or another. For example, here's Boris's method for making coconut stew again, but this time with a little more detail and some decisions. Instead of saying bring to the boil, the algorithm now says apply full heat, then it asks if the stew is boiling yet. If not, it continues to apply full heat. If so, the algorithm moves on and the heat is reduced. This is called a loop. You can see another loop later on to check if the stew is cooked yet. This algorithm is the one Boris follows when he wakes up. If it's raining, he stays in bed until the rain stops. Another loop. Otherwise, he gets dressed, then checks for rescue ships. If there's a ship, he lights the signal fire. If not, he checks to see if the tide is high enough to go fishing. At low tide, he goes coconut hunting instead. This algorithm contains a lot of logic and a lot of branching, that is, doing one thing or another. Algorithms can also be used to control machinery. The level crossing barriers in this model are closed when the train goes over a trip switch on the track. Another trip switch raises the barriers again. The same trip switches also control the flashing lights. A trip switch just before the tunnel causes the train to slow down and its lights come on. Another speeds it up again when it emerges from the tunnel. This train also stops at the station. Flowcharts are often used by programmers when designing new algorithms because they help them to think through the sequence of processes and the decisions that a program will have to make. This is a flowchart for an insertion sort algorithm. It would be useful for the leaderboard sorting problem that you saw earlier. Once a flowchart has been constructed, a programmer might then use it to write pseudocode. Pseudocode is just another way of describing how an algorithm will work in more detail. Converting pseudocode into a working program is then a relatively simple job. The final step to developing a solution to a problem is asking if the solution is any good and how it might be improved. This is called evaluation. A solution to a problem might be refined many times before it's ready to be used. Now, you might be wondering whatever happened to Boris. Well, one day a rescue ship did arrive but they saw that Boris was doing so well on the island by himself they decided to leave him there. But don't worry, they left him some company.